yeah, I feel right now the market is is healthy and in a, in a, in a good spot. Um, do you think this year, like when you get to the end of 2024, do you expect 2024 to be a growth year? Breaking down the sports card market with Jeff Wilson and Card Collector 2. What's up guys? Today I'm gonna to be reacting to a conversation that Jeff Wilson, sports card investor, had with Card Collector 2 recently about really the sports card market and what their thoughts are as we go into 2024. Coming from someone who in 2023 sold roughly over $300,000 on eBay in terms of gross sales, I have my own thoughts on the hobby. I've been quantifying how the market and aggregate has been performing, not necessarily at the player level, but in an aggregate level. So I want to see if my thoughts are on par with what these two have talked about in their podcast. So I'm going to skip over some of the pieces uh, because this is a very long form podcast. I only want to go through the pieces where they're talking about the market itself. So let's jump into that right now. Speaking, speaking of hot and cold, I wanted to yes. open our conversation today by asking you, what is your sense of the card market right now? You know, obviously you have your own card shop, so you have a sense yeah. of people coming in the shop. You also travel around to a ton of different card shows. What What is your sense of things here as we, uh, you know, are in the early stages of the new year? Yeah, it feels like, um, it feels like right now the market's, again, I say market like our world, that's probably the best way to put it. Like. Um, I, I think going into the holiday season, like we, we, we spent a lot of time looking at our numbers, kind of get an idea of like what the holiday was going to be like. And a lot of the trends we had seen in past years, we had, we had saw uh, at the end of 2023, just a little bit more ramped up. It was um, some of the busiest days we've ever had in our shop ever, like top five days all time. We're in December, 2023, um, just in terms of number of transactions. So um, I, I definitely think the market right now a lot of, in, and I would say it's similar to what I saw a lot of in 2023, where I, I think the COVID days of people coming in and just aimlessly picking boxes and ripping and hoping to hit million dollar cars, I, I don't think that is quite the same um, as it was during COVID. A I think the only thing that I'll say there is because wax prices are so ungodly expensive, it's not possible for people to just walk in and buy cards as a hobby. A little bit less, gam a lot less gambling. Um, but I still think there's people coming in looking for singles and deals and sub $300 boxes. So, um, yeah, it's been, it's been a pretty good, uh, it was a pretty good Q4 in, in 2023. And, uh, we've seen a lot of six, you know, a lot of good things, good signs in, in early 2024. So yeah, I feel right now the market is, is healthy and in a, in a, in a good spot. You know, it's, that's a great perspective, first of all, and I, I love that. So you're talking about doing your planning for this year. I'm curious, um, do you think this year, like when you get to the end of 2024, do you expect 2024 to be a growth year for your store? Do you expect it to be similar to 2023, so more of a flat year? Or do you think it could be a little bit of a down year compared to what you did in 2023? Uh, I think it'll be a growth year. Yeah, I think so. Um, 2023 was a growth year for us. It, it, we were we were flatter in 2022 because the second half of 2022 was a little bit stagnant for us. Um, and I think, I mean, it was even a little rough in the beginning of 2022, just coming off of the highs of 21. Um, but yeah, 2023 was was pretty good, and I would expect more of the same in 2024. But I think I think we'll be able to beat that. I don't expect it to be you know two three x crazy. Um, but yeah, I, I think it'll be I, I think it'll be a pretty solid year. I, I think what we figured out, especially in the second half of 2023, was you know what's working and how do we continue to build on what's working. I think it, when I had first started out, I was interested in more of, um, and, and we're still kind of the same way. But we wanted one of everything, right? I wanted you to be able to come in and say, hey, can I get this? And while that is still the case, there are some things we know are going to sell. So. In the past, I think I was a little bit more risk adverse where if I thought a product would do really well, I would buy like one case or two cases. And I think that has, that tone has changed for us where like Bowman Chrome University is the single best product we've ever sold in our shop. It's not even close. We've sold tons of that product and we went all in on it when it came out. We knew this would sell. We're 15 minutes away from one of the biggest college institutions in the country. Um, 
So, so we knew it would be a big deal for us. We're a big college football brand. I, I love cl- college football cars. So we went all in on it, and, and it performed really well. So I think that's kind of our mindset going into 2024 is when we believe in something, when we think something will do well, really put a lot more effort and attention behind that because um, we saw what it could do in 2023. So I think a full year of that and understanding what we specialize in, what does well, how we get more people in the door, um, how we appeal to all sorts of different collectors from age and demographic and collecting needs. And um, I think spending a lot more time on the data has allowed us to uh, understand what will make us successful in 24. So just to recap that, he's really giving much more of a card shop owner's perspective on wax and the market for wax. So that may not necessarily be applicable to the entire sports card market because, again, not everyone's going to have their shop with a full slate of inventory to to really go through. In terms of his comments about 2023 being a better year than 2022, I agree with that. Um, Again, he may be coming at it from a wax perspective, but as a single flipper buyer uh, and reseller, 2023 was much more of a return to normalcy for me. So I echo that sentiment. And I would say 2024, based on the preliminary data, looking at 90-day trends, which I've done in a previous video, it's showing that the 90-day trend extrapolated out for a year is basically right on par with 2023, meaning there is no growth in terms of aggregate dollars being spent in the hobby, which is not necessarily in the plans of fanatics and wanting to 10x the hobby. So individually, could you... 2x or 1.5x your business by flipping wax maybe flipping cards maybe but in terms of you know aggregate market growth i don't see it it's going to be flat total dollars in the market is not necessarily going to go up or down significantly it's going to be flat and it's 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 really a finite amount of resources yeah well that's great to hear that you're optimistic about 24 being a growth year and it's also great and probably surprising to a lot of people listening that 2023 was a growth year because you continue to see the headlines of cards dropping in price particularly high-end cards cards are selling in some of these high-end auctions for a lot less money today than what they were selling for a year ago or two years ago right and so i think if you just look at some of those headlines you get the sense of like oh the market's continuing to cool off, sports cards are continuing to fade, Um, not not as many people are collecting, not as many people are into it anymore, all the prices keep dropping. When I think that there's actually a lot of other signs which indicate the exact opposite. Um, You know, we just just saw the largest attendance ever at the National this last year, the all-time largest attendance ever. You just said that you had a growth year in your card shop and I can tell you, here at Sports Card Investor, we just set our all-time high record for people subscribing to Market Movers, our data software. By far, we we 2023 was a huge growth year for Market Movers. Our our you know number of subscribers went up month over month over month, and particularly in Q4, it really started. That's crazy, <laughs> given the amount of free resources out there. Um, that's that's a good indication that perhaps there's a lot of new hobby entrants that are coming into the market um, because most people who have been here for a while are pretty comfortable with the resources that are out there whether it's psa's auction prices ebay which is the greatest resource out there in terms of historical data Um, so it seems as though more people are wanting to to buy access to data uh, which is interesting it's a jump and so i think there's almost like a couple different things happening. Like I think, first of all, I think you're seeing this big movement and we've seen this big movement now over the last couple of years from, as you said, kind of earlier, like gambling, chasing the big hits, being willing to pay 10 grand for a flawless box and, you know, all that, all that hysteria because, you know, make yourself an, an overnight millionaire by getting the one of one and go hunt for the LeBron triple logo man or whatever. All of that hysteria, which really fueled a lot of the growth of the market in 2020 and 2021, a lot of that stuff has died down. I think instead you've now seen much more of a shift back to collecting. I think you've seen much more of a shift back to uh, lower price product and people still willing to buy wax and rip wax, but they they want to pay 
$100 for a hobby box, they don't want to pay $1,000 for a hobby box. Yeah. I'll jump in and I'm going to agree and disagree. So to the latter point that I agree with, yes, people do not want to spend a lot of money on cards. They do not want to spend a lot of money on box prices. They're still going to be the gambling addicts who are buying into breaks. To his earlier point about people want to collect, that, that is absolutely false. The data that I've broken down says that, yes, people may be shying away from the over expensive national treasures and flawless junk that Pupini puts out. But there is widespread speculation in trying to find the next superstar, specifically NFL quarterbacks, baseball prospecting. And there's always going to be a very healthy prospecting market for basketball, especially if there's an up and coming superstar like a Wimby. Basketball market's been relatively dead because the prospects haven't been that great. But if you look at football, so much money has been poured into one, the 2020 class, not in 2020, but in 2021, 2022, 2023. But whenever those classes fail because Patrick Mahomes beats them, that money gets poured into the 2022 class and then the 2023 class. And we're going to have five other people getting drafted who are going to have a lot of hype. And because it's basically Patrick Mahomes and the rest of the field, there's going to be speculative dollars that are going to be shifting around everywhere so every single year there are massive ebbs and flows in terms of the overall dollar amount being allocated to any one player if jeff was correct in saying that the over people want to collect more i would i would be seeing in my data that i'm pulling much more stable prices in terms of aggregate dollars being spent towards any given player for a given year year over year what i am seeing is widespread variance Give an example. After Joe Burrow uh, lost in the Super Bowl, his hype going into the next year was amazing. So in 2021, the market spent $20 million on his cards. In 2022, the market spent $38 million on his cards. Again, widespread speculation. 2023, it dropped back down to around 25. I have to double check. But again, you see those wide variants. The same thing, Justin Fields, a lot of preseason hype. Trevor Lawrence. $38 million spent on Trevor Lawrence cards uh, last year. That was a massive uptick from the previous year. So again, there's, there's a lot of speculation. It's just not happening at the high end because people have seen people get burned with high end cards. Yeah, right? Sure. They, they want to come into your store and they want to buy Bowman U and, you know, buy a hobby box of Bowman U and feel pretty good about whatever they got out of it because you're going to get some value return on that because the overall price of it's not that high so you're not going to get like beat up badly on buying a hobby box of bowman U. the same way that you're going to get beat up on buying a hobby box of national treasures or you know any really any higher end product and so i think i, I think that's kind of almost a whole shift and i think when you look at what we're what we have today i think although prices have fallen and although the high ends dropped off some and although you know some of the the fervor around breakers is is been lowered and and sure. uh you know certainly the the chasing big cards even though a lot of that stuff has died down i think what we have today is actually a stronger larger bigger collector base who in many ways is now starting to reemerge because of the fact that prices are lower and that they can walk into a shop such as yours and actually now feel like they get some pretty good value. So whenever he says larger volume of collector bases, again, I disagree. I think if you change that term with hobby participants, I, I may be able to get behind that, but I'm not seeing that there is a strong resurgence of collectors. Again, there's just way too many, too much volatility in prices, way too much across every single sport. I think that he is saying that much more from a up and coming card shop owner. And he is seeing what Card Collector 2 is doing as a card shop owner in terms of really being able to capitalize on selling wax to people who by and large want to gamble at today's prices. If you're buying wax, you're gambling. I mean, it could be an entertainment cost to you. I don't think it's really an entertainment cost for the average person because wax is so expensive, unless you may be buying Bowman U because, it, as they stated, biggest selling product because it's relatively inexpensive. But try to get a, a league licensed product of a mid-tier product that's respectable. Even Hoops with Wimby was quite expensive. Donruss, very expensive. A Prism Hobby Box, minimum four figures. 
and you know that's a product that really should be 100 120 150 bucks instead people are paying over a thousand dollars for it so again nobody is collecting that they're not going into a hobby shop and attempting to buy those products because they can't afford it so they're, the people who are doing that are gambling and speculating and trying to make money in the hobby. So I think the overall number of hobby participants has increased. The overall amount of speculation in the system has increased. The aggregate amount of dollars is remaining relatively constant, but it's getting shifted from hot potato to hot potato, depending on who is doing well and who's not doing well. That's, that's my take on the market. Um, it, the overall amount of speculation has it increased or decreased. Maybe it's cooled off a little bit, but it's still much more prevalent there than it was pre-COVID before the emergence of all these new hobby entrants. Yeah, and I think that's the big thing is I think the value in the lower, you, you, you know, you mentioned lower, right? And I don't think it's just the value of high-end singles. I think it's a lot of things, right? You mentioned the product, right? Product is cheaper. Bowman Chrome use right around $135 a box, two autos, deep checklist. Brakes are lower, right? Because the boxes are not as expensive as they were during COVID. Like, you know, while one of the complaints I hear a lot on like, especially on social is like box prices are still too high. I mean, Prism 2020, when it came out, that class was good at the time. I think it's become better now, but those boxes were like 2000 plus dollars now, or were 2000 plus dollars then. Prism is still expensive for sure. It's a $900 hobby box. Um, but again, that has come down. The ability to grade cards and get them back under two years. You need prices to get way less than $900 for a hobby box. For a hobby box. Again, the, the amount of Wimby Prism rookies out there, <laughs> the EV of busting at $900 is ridiculously low. So again, these prices still have to come down. Okay, so they, they went down by roughly 50% since 2020. Well, they basically 10 x in the period of four years in terms of MSRP. So if you 10 x and then drop in half, you're still five times what the normal rate was basically five, six years ago. Has, you know, that's changed dramatically. The price to grade cards has changed dramatically. Um, cost for breaks, like we definitely run a lot of breaks and similar to hobby boxes we don't sell as many thousand dollar hobby boxes as we do 100 dollars hobby boxes and we don't sell as many thousand dollar break spots as we do 100 dollars break spots right the price of entry has come down a lot on a lot of things right single cards the cost of grading the boxes the breaks and i think that has definitely um you know led to a lot more uh involvement in the market rather than again like I'm not saying there are people out there that buy five, 10, 15, $25,000 cards. We don't, we don't live in that world on a daily basis. So it's not something I can speak to as much, but uh, I think with the, the cheaper price point and entry across the board, it, it definitely brings a lot more, it's brought a lot more people in. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's exciting. I think maybe we're, we're hitting this kind of equilibrium price now where or point sure. now where the prices are, reasonable once again and you know parents can bring their kids into the store and they can buy a hobby box and all right i'm going to fast forward instead of uh reviewing the opening and card shop i'm just going to go to market trends and see what they have to say what what trends have you seen in your shop in terms of what sells today that's a little different than maybe what it would have been a, a year or two ago you mentioned you mentioned bowman U, and so yeah. I, I imagine that's one you're going to talk about here for sure Yep. Um, but beyond that, kind of what else? Like, how has the market changed over the last couple of years? Yeah, so the the growth of the NIL, like NIL changing college football has been huge for the college trading card landscape, and it has definitely been big for us. Um, so Bowman U, Caleb Williams Autos, and a lot of Panini product like NT and Flawless, um, you know, Bowman's Best University, uh, that kind of stuff is, is, has been really big. But I would say probably the biggest growth for us year over year, um, the biggest trend I see going into 2024 uh, has been really like the non-sports stuff, the Pokemon, the One Piece, and the Disney Lorcana. I think those have been really, really, um, really, really big for us. Um, I didn't start out with Pokemon right away when I first opened. I didn't know. I'm skipping. I have no interest. 
no interest. Yeah, well, that's yeah, and that's interesting because I know a couple of years ago, you know, when we were talking, baseball wasn't that big of a mix of what you were doing, but it's yep. it, the growth in that, and I think that parallels what a lot of folks have seen. I think it's interesting, like baseball is kind of back on top now, and baseball historic. Baseball has never not been on top. Let me re reiterate that. Baseball has never not been on top. What what? <laughs> I didn't catch the beginning of what Jeff had to say, but what I can say is the reason why baseball is on top, one reason, they have the largest collector base, period, of all sports. They have the largest collector base. Whenever you think, the, the analogy or the synonym to sports cards is baseball cards. People say I collect baseball cards. They don't say I collect basketball cards or football cards. That, it's just not a term. Baseball cards is Americana. So it has a long-standing tradition, and as a result, more baseball fans collect cards as opposed to basketball fans collecting basketball cards or football fans collecting football cards. It's only a recent phenomenon, in my opinion, that football cards have become such a big thing thanks to Patrick Mahomes. Football cards were a thing, but they were solidly in third place before Patrick Mahomes. Patrick Mahomes has made collecting, speculating, flipping, extremely exciting. It's also made football fun to watch. They're breaking all the records in terms of, you know, looking uh, or uh, audiences watching the sport. Basketball, I mean, we don't have anything to really be excited about. LeBron and Steph are at the tail end of their career. MJ is gone. Kobe, unfortunately, is gone. There's just not a lot of excitement. And, and really, are any of these players likable or collectible? Baseball has always been on top. Do not let anybody tell you any differently. The reason why, collector base. Historically, has always been on top. It's, it always was the most collected you know, sport. Obviously, it's got much more lineage than yeah. any of the other sports do in terms of cards. And then we went through this cycle over the last few years where all of a sudden basketball overtook baseball and even I think yeah. football overtook baseball. But now we're seeing you know, baseball kind of reposition at the top of the heap. And so I think that I think that correlates in part back to the rise of the collector again. I think sure. baseball's got that lineage of collecting and now we're seeing less of the Call flipping and the gambling on the big boxes and we're seeing more of the collecting and I think I think baseball thrives and that combined with as you said the way that tops approaches their product mix I've said that on videos numerous times. Make more affordable baseball has products. more collectors. Um, and I think that that I think that that's a good thing right now with where the market is, and I yep. think you're seeing therefore more baseball cards get out there in general because people are gravitating towards those types of boxes. Yeah, and I also feel like again while we're on that topic of you know the baseball product, I think a lot of the increased sales in baseball is probably in part due to what Topps has done with some of their you know promotion of said products like the the Brady Chase, the MVP buyback. Um, a lot of those different things that Topps has, I mean, the Victor Green chase was, was cool. I know you were in. Unfortunately, the data is not showing that these gimmicks are really leading to translations in higher sale prices, or at least a, a growth in the hobby. So I know Fanatics wants to 10X the hobby. I think, I, I hear what Card Collector 2 is saying, but at the same, if, if you're looking at the data, there is not a substantial uptick in Topps aggregate sales. And that's just looking at tear peak through eBay. I get it, it's a flawed data source, but it doesn't, it's not holistic of you know, what's happening in hobby shops, but it, you know, presumably that stays constant over time in terms of looking at the data. But we're not really seeing a massive uptick in terms of the aggregate amount of dollars spent on key search terms tops year over year over year. Texas for, for that. So the, the follow up to that is these gimmicks that tops is doing, that's like, keeping status quo so maybe if they didn't do the gimmicks the market would actually be behind so these gimmicks are actually just keeping the market at bay so um you know i don't think it's i don't think it can be overstated the value of those promotions especially from a card shop owner um you know being able the, the brady auto is big i know that was a bounty by someone else um but that obviously had a ton of demand for an already good product and then you know the um the 101 uh, debut cards from mm -hmm. debut Chrome, like that added a ton of demand and that box is only about $135. Then you throw in the buyback to a Topps Chrome product that is historically a popular one. Collectors love the Chrome 
type products. Um, so yeah, I think those have been really, really big. And um, I think, again, I, I don't think that can be overstated what that can do to a card, uh, to a card shop. I think those... Again, the, as he's saying, that it's more of you know, a card shop's perspective and not necessarily the consumer's perspective. So card shop, yeah, absolutely. The MVP program is going to help you sell your wax. In terms of it being an aggregate boost to the overall market, it's not really because people, whenever they're looking on eBay, they're buying singles and they're not necessarily spending more money on singles. Yeah, I, so I, I guess that is a good thing I, that I will credit Tops and Fanatics for is that MVP buyback program. You need to get more people in the, in the card shop. So I'm, I'm not necessarily disputing that, that any of this is bad. Uh, I think this is all great stuff. It is certainly helpful for the card shop owner. It's not necessarily when we're speaking in the context of you know how are baseball cards doing? Is the market getting bigger? That's not happening. It's it's flat. There's the same finite amount of dollars that are being spent on cards. They're they're the finite amount. It's not growing. It's not shrinking. It's just kind of stuck. Those, those things were really big for us in 2023. Yeah, yeah. No, I, it's been great. I, I'm excited to see that innovation for sure. I remember when I first talked to. Um, when Fanatics, you know, first announced the news that they had bought Tops, and some of the first, some of the early conversations I had with some of the leaders at Fanatics about their strategy, and this was in the early stages, like well before they got to implement anything. One of the things that one of the Fanatics leaders said was they wanted to make sure that each new release had a purpose and had some uniqueness to it that was gonna get people excited, had a chase or something that made it different rather than just releasing all of these sets one after another when yeah. it almost seemed like some of them were a little bit purposeless. So they haven't made, drew their commentary on this, but my initial take to that is this is fanatics jumping headfirst into gambling. They want to be a gambling platform so eventually they want to get into that space sports cards are a legal form of gambling there is no um, gaming commission that is overseeing breaks there's no gaming commission that oversees the distribution of boxes for which you don't know the contents other than you know you're getting x amount of cards per pack although sometimes manufacturers don't necessarily you know give you what you're supposed to get um, so by hearing Jeff say that, I'm not surprised by that because I think that's also things that I've heard and things that we've all seen. We've seen it with, obviously, the Tom Brady card. They want the consumer to gamble on the big chase hit. You know, the MLB debut patch, the Tom Brady that some people were saying was a million dollar card. Why is that a million dollar card whenever Tom Brady's contender's you know, ticket, uh, championship ticket, is you know, a fraction of that? So they want people to get hyped up so it goes and sells product. Like th this, is, this is all used car salesman tactics at a macro level industry to get people to get excited about something that's really not as valuable as what they think that it is. But the chase, the excitement leads to speculation. This kind of goes back to my original point. There is now more speculation in the hobby, whether it's people buying players and speculating that they're gonna go up in value and become the next Patrick Mahomes, the next Shohei Otani, the next Mike Trout or speculation in wax prices. Again, these little things that they are doing are not going to be drivers uh, or you know, pressure to decrease wax prices. It's not going to happen. It is not in Fanatic's best interest to have wax prices be low. It is in their best interest for there to be widespread speculation and hype for a release so that after they you know, pass the baton on the Tom Brady autograph that people were hyping for a million dollars that they can't even, can barely sniff six figures or five figures, they're gonna go on to the next gimmick and hype that and all the hype is gonna be a million dollars. And you know the, the sales as they trickle in through Golden and Heritage and eBay are gonna be disappointing, but it's bringing the gambling addicts into the hobby and that is fanatic strategy to grow the hobby. It is to get more degenerate gamblers and speculators into the hobby, not grow a collector base. So interesting, we heard it from the horse's mouth. And I feel like this year was the first year that we really saw Top start to put that into action. And you just mentioned, I mean, you had the, you had obviously the MLB debut patches, you had the Brady cards, you had the, um, you know, Otani Babe Ruth, um, yep. you know, uh, dual autos and definitive. And, and in Inception, you had the first moment cards where they put the pieces of the, you know, the base, the base. Uh, yep. that, players reached you know so it's like 
very intentional, um, but very... Gosh, I could go on for days about this. The fact that people are making such a big deal about these innovations, th these are not innovations. Th these are maybe returning back to normalcy. If you remember, Upper Deck did not hype Michael Jordan and LeBron James autographs. You could get a dual Michael Jordan, LeBron James autograph out of Upper Deck MVP, $1.99 a cent a pack. You could get LeBron James, Michael Jordan dual autographs out of $2.99 packs. They did not hype that this is some magical, mysterious thing that you know you can only get if you really give a large sum of money. Like they were just inserted in every single Upper Deck product. They weren't, they weren't necessarily hyped. So now we're really getting force-fed the marketing from Fanatics. Oh, well, we have this shiny golden object over here that really sticks out in the hobby. Uh, you, you can only access it by really forking over your money for our overpriced product that you know card shop owners are gonna happily sell to you and if you get nothing out of the pack you know just bring in some of your garbage base cards and maybe get a little bit of discount of a credit like you know maybe five to ten percent off of your next purchase so that you can gamble and lose again it's kind of what this hobby is coming into or turning into i will say i do want to give credit the intent for fanatics is to rip you off that's you know they <laughs> they have to make money as a company but I do like that they are doing stuff. So it's a double-edged sword. We, we should not have had to wait this long to get a Babe Ruth Shohei Otani dual autograph. We literally should not have had to wait this long. We should not have had to wait this long to get an MLB debut patch. We shouldn't have had to wait this long to get a gimmicky Tom Brady autograph. Now, the fact that they are forced feeding these things down and spending so many marketing dollars. Now we got the Bronny James LeBron dual autograph, not even NBA licensed, you know, these are things that are just getting force fed down your throat so that it sells more wax. It's just whether or not this actually grows the hobby. I, my take on it is this is causing, again, more speculative gamblers to get into the hobby, which is not how you grow a sustainable hobby. These people are going to get in. They're going to shell out a lot of money and they're going to get smacked in the face because they're not going to pull the big hit. And after spending you know, thousands and thousands of dollars over a couple year period, they're going to go do something else because, you know, the, the product that they're going to get is not giving them what they want. Very well thought out uh, things that were going to get people excited. I mean, even a lot of people kind of bagged on the taco fractor thing as being cheesy. But even that, I mean, that got us all talking about it, regardless of whether, yeah, regardless of whether, you know, people really cared about winning, you know, Taco Bell for life or not, it still added a, a a, a chase element, a fun element to talk about to the products. And so I, I think they're really starting to deliver in that regard. And I think that I, 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 as a cart, as a, as a soon to be card shop owner, that has me really excited. Um, and I imagine as a. All right, guys, I'm wrapping this up. I think that because the most of the other topics are just going to be, you know, about nothing that's market related. Um, my takeaway, this conversation was much more geared towards those who are going to own a card shop. So obviously, if you own a card shop, business is booming right now. You have gambling addicts coming into your, your shop, buying boxes, buying into breaks. And of course, if you're getting those, those products directly from Fanatics at a discount, you can obviously make money and it's, it's, it's a margin-driven business for you and you're, you can do very, very well with it. This was not necessarily a conversation that is discussing the overall sport, sports card market in the context of the consumer who walks into the card shop or someone who is buying product or you know, cards on eBay or some other platform. This didn't appear to be that type of conversation. The story that I believe is actually to be true is much different than the story that they are painting from a card shop or breaker's perspective. Of course, breakers are going to be doing well in this economy. Of course, sports cards, shop owners are going to be doing well if they get their hands on the product and have you know, access to the product. If you're somebody who is buying singles and continually seeing those singles decrease in value because the people buying them are now speculating on the next hottest thing, it's not so fun, right? There's still a lot of speculation in the hobby. There's not as many collectors in the hobby as there once was. So that's my take on this. Let me know what you all think down below. Uh, we'll see you guys next time.